Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Thomas Demaria, and I'm with the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement. And uh, tonight's talk is about improving communication about difficult topics with your teenager. Um, you can reach our website and learn more about us at schoolcrisiscenter.org and also uh, another organization which we run called uh, the Coalition to Support Grieving Students at grievingstudents.org. So uh, before I talk about how to communicate uh, with uh, your teenagers, I thought it'd be best if we take a step back and we'll talk a little bit about what uh, being a teenager is all about. And that was kind of a hard time, but it also could be a fun time. Um, not every uh, parent always has problems with teenagers, uh, but it, it really comes down to understanding where they are because given all their preoccupation with all the things that are going on in their life, it's hard for them sometimes to get a perspective of where you are. So I think by understanding them and by getting a sense of what they're going through and learning some tips about how to open up and talk about very difficult topics, uh, you can enjoy these uh, teenage years and take pride in the relationship uh, you have with your uh, team and uh, appreciate all the effort that you put in when they were children to help them turn out okay. So what are causes of stress for uh, teens? Well, part of what they do is they start to begin to reject uh, family and cultural expectations. They start to want to be their own person. And sometimes that goes a little bit too far. Sometimes they throw out all the stuff that is helpful for them because they think they have to be their own person or be independent. But that gives them uh, kind of a crisis because they don't really have a blueprint in terms of where to go and what to do with their life. Uh, and parents have to adjust to that because the teen who you normally would hang out with or spend time with wants to spend more time with their friends. So it's a rough time because parents can feel rejected and uh, teens can feel they have to do it on their own without really having uh, the cognitive maturity or emotional maturity really to make some very tough decisions. Teenage years are also a big change in their bodies in terms of sexual and physical maturity. A lot of things are going on. There's a lot of hormones and a lot of processes that you may understand because you've had these processes for a while, but the teen really doesn't have, and they can cause for some teens a great tumult. Again, it's also a transition from being dependent on your parents and relying on your parents and every, everything to being more independent. And that's kind of kind of hard because it's, going into a place where you really don't know what to do. And because of that, even though they won't admit it, they become sort of dependent on the peers and the peer culture. So they began to look to fit in with this peer culture who are all making that transition with them. And their friends and their peers are the major support of both support, sometimes influence, but also demands because uh, to fall out and not be with their peers might mean that they feel they're gonna be left alone or not as cool or as tough or as um, positive and social as their friends are. Social media increases greatly uh, during the teenage years. And uh, this is a question for parents. Do you want social media to be the only influence on your child? Especially if you and your son or daughter are not getting along, well, do you want social media it can be their source of information? Is that where you want them to learn about values, about life, about really important issues? Or do you want to be with them as they start to go through a whole period of their life of experimentation oftentimes with sexuality, alcohol and drug use, other risk taking? Do you want to be the person who can kind of help them sort out what's important and what's not important? So it's a, a lot going on, a lot going on for you as a parent too, but there's some secrets that I've learned in my 30 years working with teenagers and families about ways to kind of make this better. And again, it all starts with communication. So let's define what happens with parents during this time. Well, there's oftentimes conflict with parents, uh, and it happens more likely if your teenager is depressed. Uh, depressed teenagers sometimes have more fights with their parents because Parents are recognized sometimes that anger is a symptom of depression oftentimes, and sometimes the adolescent will lash out and throw a lot of stuff at the parents and blame the parents for things, and the parents get upset, and then they start fighting, but it's really just the adolescent uh, feeling depression. It could be biological based, based on all the stuff that's going on with them, or it could be due to um, the fact that they're going through a lot of changes and they're feeling 
overwhelmed and they're feeling helpless, you know, they could really fall into what we would think is a clinical depression. Now, what's interesting, though, is they've been doing research about what do adolescents and parents fight about, and the direct conflicts have to be more about surface issues, dating, curfew, and friends, and less about the more serious issues, substance use, auto safety, and sex. So parents fight about stuff that's relatively less important, and the more important stuff doesn't get talked about. So how do you build a base to start talking about the more serious issues? How do you not let it get shut down and just discuss when they should be in, who their friends are, who they're dating or not dating. I mean, there's more important issues, especially, again, their their wellness and health. Um, and a previous uh, presentation I did was about adolescent depression. And if you have those concerns, I urge you to take a look at that one where I cover that a little bit more thoroughly. Now, for adolescents, they start to have more emotional extremes because of all those crisis they're going to, and also because of also where those hormones are kind of causing a lot of changes in their body. And it's a time where they feel increased self-consciousness, embarrassed, awkward, lonely, nervous, and ignored. And they're more at risk for these mood disruptions if they don't have popularity with their peers, they're not doing well in school or in sports, or if they have family problems. Again, it's a time of tremendous, tremendous pain for them, which could result in them blooming and blossoming, but it can also mean where they flounder a little bit. And that's where they really need parents and caregivers to really help them along. So understanding emotions in your son uh, and daughters um, has to do with, with you understanding that they may not know about how to describe what they're feeling. They may try to avoid talking about it. We may have language that they may have not. And teens may try to hide their feelings because they don't want others to bother, be bothered by them or to be ashamed, so they kind of lock it all inside. That's why, again, communication is really, really important to try to get inside what's really bothering them, but you can't expect them to know exactly how to articulate all that's going on in their mind. What gets parents worried, and it's certainly a realistic concern, is uh, at any point in time uh, in their lifetime, this is when there's the highest prevalence of risk behaviors and experimentation. It peaks in late adolescence, um, but we tend to see that these risk-taking behaviors um, are worse if they had problems before that in childhood. So it, although it may peak in, in at a late adolescence, again, if you've had problems with the child because of conduct issues, et cetera, when they were younger, it might get worse, but the risky behaviors are what causes those concerns. Now, among adolescents aged 12 to 17, this is a study done in 2018, 2019, 15% had a major depressive episode and about 37% had persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. So that sadness that I talked about before can be a common feeling for them. Uh, and you have to keep an eye out that it doesn't turn into uh, depression. 4% had a substance use disorder. Um, almost 1.6% had an alcohol use disorder. Order, and 3.2% had illicit drug use disorder. So there's a lot of teens experimenting. 18.8%, nearly 19%, seriously considered attempting suicide. Almost 16% made a suicide plan. Almost 9% attempted suicide. And 2.5% made a suicide attempt regarding medical uh, treatment. So that risky behavior combined with mood disruption, combined with the sense that they don't have anybody to support them can make those years kind of scary. Uh, and that's why they need their, your, your support to kind of help them through this difficulty. Now, adolescents have what we believe is this egocentrism. They have this imaginary audience where they think they're the center of attention, that everybody's looking at them, everybody's going to see their pimple, everybody's going to see that their clothes are not cool. And so they become very self conscious, concerned with new trends and fashion. They have this big need for privacy, reluctance to tell you much about themselves, and they're concerned with shame and embarrassment. They're shy, and they believe that they're constantly being evaluated, watched, and judged by their peers. They believe that everybody's going to notice if they don't have the same clothes as everybody else, or everybody's going to notice if their hair is not done properly, or if they've gained weight. Or it's more than any time in life they really become aware of their social status and how they appear to others which causes a great deal of distress for them. They also, though, combined with this whole um, notion that everybody's watching them, is they believe that they're 
people unique. They're omnipotent, that they have this power and invulnerability, and they justify that for risk-taking. That's only for other people. I'm not going to get hurt, or I can do this. My body can take it. And they, they really push the bodies to the limit. And sadly, a lot of children do get uh, in very dire circumstances and really have a hard time because of that. So this belief that they're special or this belief that somehow uh, they are not going to be injured can cause great difficulties for them. Now, the dependence to independence uh, transition is often mastered if they can um, you know, understand that the transition can be very bumpy and difficult. Um, they want new interpersonal relationships, but they're going to lose the parental influence if they have that. So they want to develop more self-independence by denying the dependency needs and, and anxiety by overdoing self-centeredness and belief that they are justified in asking for things. So they're both dependent still, and they're not getting things done for themselves, but in, in an odd way, they're, they're trying to be more uh, independent by not doing it the right way. Uh, they, they, they tend to throw up all the resources, and they try to put themselves in a position where they're not really getting help. So what I'd like to talk about now is common communication traps that parents get caught in with, with teenagers. Um, and first we start off with <laughs> the traps and then we'll work out the solutions. But it's kind of important to realize that these are things that parents get caught in a, a great deal. And the first one is responding to provocation. Think about the adolescent who's trying to get this independence, although they're still dependent on you. And what they do is they provoke you. And by provoking with you, they lead you. They get you on the hook. And you can't get out of these situations. And the goal is to not respond to pro provocations. And part of that is understanding that you're being provoked. These are just some statements that are provocations that adolescents could say. You never consider my feelings. Nobody around her ever pays any attention to me. Do you always have to put yourself first? Can you hear your, your teenager telling you this? Why don't you ever think about what I might want? I've had all of this I'm going to take. Why do you always insist on having your own way, no matter how much it hurts me? If you really loved me, cared about me, or wanted to help me, you would. If you really wanted me to do well in school, you'd. Don't you even care about my problems? What has been happening to me? Even a normal parent should be able to. Even you should be able to. Everyone knows that my parents are, and the favorite of everybody, other parents let their children, other parents give their children, et cetera. So all of these are things that I'm sure you've heard every so often, but they're provocation. There's no good way to answer these because no matter how you answer them, you sound defensive, you sound like you're trying to justify your behavior, you got to not take the bait. Remember that fish. Don't take the bait. Don't put the hook in your mouth because you're not going to get anywhere. These are provocations. You don't respond with a provocation with an answer. You respond with a provocation in a different way. And these are just a few others that you might want to kind of see if you're heard. A person who really wanted me to succeed wouldn't object to. Why don't you ever want to make me happy? Why don't you ever act like other mothers? Why don't you ever take a close look at yourself? This is different from when you grew up. Suddenly, the, <laughs> what you learned and what you went through is totally different. That what they're going through is so special, so different, so unique, et cetera. So again, all provocation. So um, learning verbal self-defense is really helpful. Otherwise, like the people being pictured there, you're going to get into this match where you can't win. When somebody provokes you, they're want you to participate in this dance, this dance of anger. Don't go there. So the first thing is, know you're being provoked. Stop yourself from quickly responding. I know you want to zip back or you want to say something. It's not going to get you anywhere. Because if you respond to the provocation, the provocation is going to lead you. If you want to address really what's going on, listen for the real issue need. Provide empathy, validation, and support. I hear you. I, 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 I 
think we can work on this together. I'm sorry you feel that way. Look for a win-win situation. If you start getting into defending yourself, even if it can be highly provocative, you're not a real father, you don't do anything for me. Meanwhile, you've done a lot. You sacrifice, you work two jobs. You don't sleep at night because you worry about so much about them. You don't care about me. You can't justify that. You can't win. So accept the fact that you're not going to win. Practice verbal self-defense and try to figure out how to get to the underlying issue. With you. Another one you have to try to avoid is tell me the truth so I can then yell at you. This is what parents practice. I want you to be really open with me. Teens tell me this all the time. I want you to be really open. I want you to share everything. We want to hear, and we're not going to judge you. And as soon as the teen tells you something you don't want to hear, they start screaming at the teenager. Mom and dad, I had sex with my boyfriend. What? I can't believe it. Uh, and right away, your fear causes you to get angry and yelling. Right away, the teen learns what? Don't tell mom and dad the truth. You're not going to be happy that your daughter may be having sex at a young age or unprotected sex or sex with multiple partners. But how do you help her start to think about it? I can tell you, yelling at them, embarrassing or shaming them doesn't work. Or if your daughter says, you know, I was at the party the other night and I took some pills. I don't know what they were. And you guys look panicked and fearful and scared and start crying. You're not yelling, but you're telling her she can't tell you anything anymore. And I find parents set themselves up all, of, all, all the time with this. They want to know. And I think it's important for you to know as best as you can. But if you make it such a big deal when they tell you, and it is a big deal, I'm not saying it isn't, but if you react in such a way that makes it so hard, you know, they're not going to tell you. So when your daughter says something to you or your son says something to you, you just say, okay, honey, thanks for sharing. We appreciate that. Tell me more. Well, I don't want to talk right now. Okay. Let us know when you feel ready, but I want to thank you for sharing that with us. And then let some time go by. Don't knock on their door. You want to talk more about what you told me? You, you can't, can't, can't. Just like you don't respond to a provocation, it doesn't get anywhere. Don't, don't fall into tell me the truth so that I can yell at you. It just doesn't fly, and you'll shut the adolescent down. Avoid punish first and ask questions later. Your son or daughter comes home late. That's it. You're grounded. Give me your cell phone. You're not going to use the car versus asking the question. If your son comes home late, says, son, we were worried about you. Why don't you go to bed, and we'll talk this over tomorrow morning. Or, son, we found some drug paraphernalia in your room. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about it, but, you know, why don't you grab a bite to eat, and we'll sit down, and we'll kind of discuss this a little bit. If you are going to react by punishing without asking them to explain themselves, you become the jerk. You become the person that caused the problem. It's a game, let's lose the blame. They did something wrong. They do something they're embarrassed or ashamed by. But as soon as you get very punitive or uh, you know, act like somebody who's giving them rules or instructions, that independent thing is going to come up. And suddenly you're the jerk. You don't understand me, et cetera. A game that adolescents play all the time. Let's lose the blame. And if you punish first and ask questions later, that's what happens. Don't let them lose the blame. And pick timing for when you want to talk about certain things. So how do you deal with disclosures and when they say something to you, well, you got to manage your immediate expression of personal feelings, anger, fear, embarrassment, what your teen is sharing with you. Later, you can share your sadness and worries, but not right. You want to then, when you talk to them, say, we all make mistakes. What can you learn from this situation? Please share all the details so we can help you figure out possible solutions. And you want to assess whether your teen is still in any danger. For example, if they were in a fight with some kids and the kids are in a gang or the kids are kids are known to do kind of criminal type of things. You don't want the kids to say, oh, don't worry about it. I got it under control because then you don't really know how you can help. Them. You want to give them the knowledge that it's upsetting that you went through this, but we'll support you through this difficult time. We're going to be here. You. We got your back. We're going to be here. You. And we'll figure out how you can learn from this situation. I had a parent tell me that their son went to a party, parents went away, and left their teenagers in the house without any supervision, and they had this wild party. And at the wild party, there was drug use, there was people uh, engaging in inappropriate uh, sexual activities, there was people having fights. And 
the teen left the party knowing that the police were going to come or something bad was going to happen, and they left. And as they got to the door, the mom and dad said, how was the party? And they said, it got kind of out of control, but I don't want to talk about it. So the kid went up to the room, and the parents bit their lips and waited. And later on, the, their teenage son went down to get some food. And they said, oh, son, uh, it sounds like it was a scary situation for you. What happened? And then the teen told them all that went down, and the parents said, well, it's one thing to get into a problem situation because you don't really know exactly what to expect, but it showed a lot of courage to leave that situation and not remain there. Um, and just to let you know, later on, the parents um, you know, learned that the police did come to the house. There was arrest made. There was a lot of other things that went down. So the teen did a good thing, but he wouldn't have shared anything because he thought he was protecting his friends and peers if the parents went at him too far. You got to let them share a little bit uh, in time and about their details. Otherwise, they're going to all close down. You're not going to get any information. The other real important thing is uh, power struggles, uh, just like provocation, usually do not achieve anything. And shaming your son or daughter, I'm so embarrassed by you, you bring shame to this family, or I have to be right. You, know, you, don't, you don't win anything with a power, power struggle. One person will win. But the other person often feels humiliated. And when a person feels humiliated, they look to get your back in some way. And these are just statements that are examples of power struggles. Because I'm the parent and you are the child. So if you say things like that, the child may listen to what you say because you're bullying them, but they're not going to tell you things. They're going to try to be sneaky. Or they may be defined. You cannot make me do anything. Go, go to your room. You can't make me do anything. So you're going to get a mature young adult who might be stronger than you or certainly is more formidable, you're going to try to tackle them and bring them to the room or, you know, what are you going to do? Give me your phone. No, take it from me. So your follow, you just, it keeps getting in the situation and it makes it more difficult. I am right and you are wrong. No compromise, not a win-win situation. Or shaming them. You were not raised to act this way. You've embarrassed the family. You've embarrassed your grandmother. You're, again, it just doesn't work. So try to avoid those power struggles because they don't get anywhere. And if you're in them, say, listen, son, I, I realize we're going back and forth. I'm sorry, I, I, this is not the way to handle it. Can we back up a little bit and start this conversation again? Again, try to undo when you get into these, these power struggles that just really don't lead you anywhere. And these are just examples of how to get out of the power struggle. I'm sad that you feel that way. You're not admitting you cause it, but you can just say, I'm sad that you feel that way. You show empathy. What can we do to work this out? It's solution-focused if there's a problem. Can you explain to me about why you feel this way? You clarify their needs. You figure out what really is going on. You don't jump to the conclusion that you can mind read or know just what's going on. I'm sorry that I hurt you since I love you. You might say something. Parents are not perfect, too. I know, I know that's a big surprise, but I've learned it. Parents are not perfect also, and you might say things that hurt them. And it's okay to say, I'm sorry that I hurt you. I didn't mean to hurt you. I, I love you, but I was a little worried. That's okay. You can say, I guess I made a mistake. How can we move past this now? It's admitting imperfection. Because you want to model that for them too, because this may be a surprise to you, but adolescents make mistakes and adolescents are not perfect. But you have to model good communication by admitting that sometimes you make mistakes, you apologize, you own it, and you want to build to the future. How can we move past this now? And you always, always, always try to thank them. Thank you for sharing this. You want to reinforce openness. Thank you for your courage. It must have been hard for you to do. I admire you. Praise, praise, praise. Uh, a little trick that uh, parents use, too, is they'll bring up the conversation the next day. They say, you know, son, I was just thinking about you today, and I was really proud of how courageous you are to tell me that. That was really hard to do. Thank you very much. Letting us teenager know that you're thinking about them in a positive way and you're proud of what they do or proud of the lessons learned. They made a mistake. They're trying to fix it. That's a, that's a great way to let them know that you're in their head and, and you're someone that cares about them. And these are the hard ones. Active listening. That means eye contact, looking at them in the eye. Your body posture is an open body posture. It's slowed. Hands across the chest. Staring down your daughter ain't going to get your daughter to think you're listening to them. Or looking away or watching TV. 
doesn't do it. You got to be facing them. You have to have body posture that things open. And I've learned that restating what people tell you is a good way to let them know that you're listening or try to rephrase it in some way. Ask them questions and let them finish. Don't make rebuttals or the famous yes, but, yes, but, yes, but. It's, it, it's not a trial. You're not doing it across examination. You want to let them speak. You want to let them talk. And you don't want to you don't want to shut them down. So try to give active listening that you really are trying to learn from what they're telling you. So what also I think happens oftentimes is arguments start to escalate. It starts off with, what did you do yesterday? And then the adolescent says, what do you want to know? And then you can see the anger level rising, rising, rising. And what happens when you're in that escalation, you get more irrational. When the level of emotionality gets high, the level of rationality and clear thinking gets low. And then cursing happens, name calling happens, provocations happening. And sometimes parents feel like getting physical and the adolescent will do too. Don't you dare. How dare you get in your mother's face? How dare you get in my face? Who do you think you are? Blah, 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 blah. You can see it escalating. So what do you do when it escalates? You have the common sense to know what it is and say, listen, let's, let's take a breather. I'd like to take a break. Time out here. Time out here. You have that referee in your mind. How about we take a walk together? Can we resume this talk at a later time? You shut it down. It ain't going to go anywhere if you escalate. A lot of conflicts start that way. They don't start with, with verbal violence or physical violence or name calling or cursing. It just ends up that way because one person didn't know to take a break. So if your son said, Dad, this is pissing me off. I need to get out of this conversation. You say, okay, son, I hear you want to take a break. Why don't we do that? Let me know when we can talk again. I'll, I'll follow up after dinner. Or you want to take a walk and just sit outside and do whatever, um, just to distract ourselves from this. Yeah, sure. You bring the emotional level down. There's a sweet spot. There's a good place that you can have where you can talk about topics. But when it gets too angry and it gets too hot, or if your spouse has to come in or your partner has to come in and break up the, the argument, eh, that's not a that's not a good discussion and good communication. That's a situation that got out of control. So how do you pull that back and not get into that? Another important uh, relationship, uh, uh, I guess, awareness is you end the talk that is going nowhere. It's going around and around and around. Where were you last night? I was with my friends. What were you doing last night? Just hanging out. Well, where were you last night? I was with my friends. Just hanging out. Well, that's not enough. I want to know. Dad, we're sitting in the park just hanging out. But what park? It's just going around and around and around and around. It keeps Both people keep saying the same thing. But no, you're on a merry-go-round. and ain't going nowhere, and it doesn't take you anywhere. So what you do is you pull out of that, and you start to know when to bring up topics, opportune times to talk. When your adolescent is tired, angry, stressed, distracted, it doesn't work. So how do you prepare to have the talk about an important talk with, a topic with them? Well, you have to ask yourself, is this time convenient for you both? If you're rushing out the door and he's rushing out the door, she's rushing out the door, they're rushing out the door, it's not convenient for you both. Not a good time. Will there be any distractions while you're talking? Cell phone, got to turn them off. Put them in the other room. Just say, son, can I have 15 minutes of your time? Can we just put the cell phones in the other room, turn off the TV or we just go out back or take a walk or something, don't have the distraction. It's just going to take one person off topic and nothing can enrage a parent. Then in the middle of a heated discussion, the adolescent's texting people or fiddling with their phone and the parent says, aren't you listening? Aren't you paying attention? The adolescent says, yes, I am. But it, 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 it could be that red flag. Are you both prepared to discuss the one topic? You pick one topic only. You have a beginning, middle, and an end, and you own end when you get through that one topic. You don't pile more on. And you, at the start, say, what is the one goal, the one topic, the one goal that we want to get from this conversation? Really very important, because if you add a lot on, it doesn't really help. You want to give you and the adolescent a chance to be successful at communicating and resolving issues. And you want to be able to kind of really have that opportunity there. How much time will be allotted to the conversation? Adolescents are, seem like they're always busy. They're always trying to do a lot of stuff, and they'll tell you how important and <laughs> busy they are. Okay, I get it, I get it, but can you give me 15 minutes? 
15 minutes, just you time. Put the cell phones in the other room, just sit around the dining table. We're going to talk about um, your curfew. And I just want to get your thoughts about it. And, 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 and that will be it. Nothing else. Not curfew, allowance, uh, alcohol in the breath you smelled the other day, who they're dating. No, no, no. One top, one top. And who else should be part of the conversation? If you're talking, should your husband be there? Should the stepfather be there? Should an, an aunt who's close to the family be there? Who should be part of the conversation? That should be agreed to too, because you don't want to have splitting going on where mom talks, grandma talks, you know, uh, uncle talks, all talks about the topic. You know, who should be part of the conversation and who should not be part of the conversation? It usually doesn't work well when there's a sibling or a person who both of you don't feel comfortable being in the conversation. When should the talk end? When do you know you've talked about it enough? Sometimes you won't get to a conclusion. Sometimes you won't get to a place where everything is resolved, and that's okay. But if you get to at least a good place, where's the stopping point? How do you shut it? When should the talk end? Who will summarize what was discussed or agreed to? We agree that we need to talk more about it. Okay, but we talked about this. We decided that. We need to look into, you know, maybe sorting out the whole curfew issue. You think that it's hard for you to go out because, you know, you have to go far away from home. And because you don't have a car, you rely on other people. And this all ties into the whole car situation about whether you want to we can get your car or help you borrow our car sometimes. We have to think about that a little bit and get back to you. But, okay, that's what we talked about. Is there a need for further talk about the topic? You're not going to conclude anything from just one 15-minute or 20-minute talk. That tends to be a good sweet spot to talk about that. Um, set up another time. It might take a couple of discussions. If the adolescent wants an immediate answer, they say, well, can't we resolve this now? Provocation. Uh, you just say, listen, this, it's kind of complex as you're a unique person. I want to understand more and got to talk to my wife, my partner, my friend, whoever is in the house. That part of the team that raises them. I need to get their input too, and then we'll we'll get back together and we'll talk to you. Do I need to get more information or do you need to get more information before we continue this talk again? Again, all setting the good stage that a conversation will succeed. These are not good situations. <laughs> In fact, research says that a lot of family conflict happens around when one person's driving in the conversation. It's also true for couples, so you can improve your relationship. Don't fight in the kitchen or during eating, um, don't fight while driving, um, don't try to have a conversation when your teenager is just waking up. It just doesn't fly. These are not good places. The timing and location is just not worthwhile. Um, just to talk a little bit, and I know this is a tangent a little bit, but I think it's worth appreciating that uh, the overall screen use among teens and tweens increased by 17% from 2019 to 2001, 21, growing more rapidly than in the four years prior. And this is just the amazing one. Uh, among tweens, 8 to 12, five hours and 33 minutes daily from four hours and 44 minutes. Among teenagers, 13 to 18, eight hours and 39 minutes from seven hours and 22 minutes. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Almost nine hours a day, other people are occupying your team's attention and telling them what to do. So appreciate that if you can get just 15 minutes, you're not asking for a lot, but appreciate they're being indoctrinated by a lot of messaging by a lot of people. And what's interesting also about social media is it's not diverse uh, comments that kids are getting. They're getting comments of, with other people who may share their bias or their viewpoint. So it doesn't really help them sort out a lot of different viewpoints and making well-educated decisions that sometimes just reinforces what they want to believe anyway. Again, bad time to resolve things if you and your wife are fighting and bring the child in, or if you're tired, if, if you and your wife or you and your husband or you and your partner are having difficulties, not a good time to try to talk to your children. If you're exhausted after a long day and the teenager has an issue, it's not a good time. you got to push it off to a time where you feel you're ready, and that's really very important. So I want to back up again uh, and talk about conversation stoppers. These are classic, and I've seen them in parent sessions, and I've heard about them from teens. 
and see if these identify you at any time. Really important to kind of kind of take a look at. The me, me, me. I'm me right, you wrong. It's all about me. Uh, I also call that the opera singer, the me, 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 where you basically tell the teenager that he's wrong. It's always, you're always right. You're perfect. It's all about your needs. Wow, what a way to turn them off pretty quickly. Uh, if you're a categorizer, it's all or nothing, no shades of gray. Either you're a good kid or you're a bad kid. Either we love you, we don't love you. If you do that, we don't love you anymore. If you leave the house, you're disappointing us. Well, you, you may be disappointed, but it's not an all or nothing. If you categorize, basically you're teaching this all or nothing type of situation, which is not healthy. The spoiler, watching TV together. Finally, you get some time with your teen and you start bringing up tough topics. I'd like to talk to you about you and your boyfriend and what's been going on with you two. Not just spoiling a good time. You don't want to do that. The critic, where you're always finding faults, errors, and mistakes, rather than looking at the glass half full, you're looking at the glass half empty. You want to be more optimistic and not be the critic. So when the adolescent does something, they help you with a chore, say, listen, you know, I appreciate all the effort you put into it. and uh, you know, it's a good start. And rather than, you know, when you were doing that, you didn't paint this, or some spots, you spilled something on the floor. It just doesn't work. They, again, they're sensitive. They, they don't like to be rejected. If you point that stuff out, all you're doing is feeding the fire. The blamer, it's all their fault. If something goes wrong, for example, if your son or daughter comes home drunk, oh, I can't believe you did that. Why'd you do this to us? Instead of saying, listen, you know, let's talk when you feel a little bit better, uh, but let's see how much you drank. Is it is it too much? Are you feeling sick? You want to make sure they're safe. But then the next morning, say, listen, you know, I, I kind of have to take some responsibility for what happened. What do you mean? Well, you know, when you drink that much, sometimes there's stuff bothering you or something might be going on, or maybe we should talk a little bit about you know, how you use alcohol or, or I, you know, our values about that is that we don't want you drinking or using drugs or anything. So you've, you've grown up a little bit because it can affect your body and your brain. But help me understand, like, how, how you know, what's going on and, and so we understand a little bit better. You know, it's not something we approve of, but obviously it happens. So let's figure it out together. Again, that's not blaming. Uh, and that doesn't really work. Stonewalling, uh, you build walls to stall the process. I'm not going to talk to you until your behavior changes. So then you're not going to talk. And you're basically putting up this wall around them that, again, that power struggle that's not going to get anywhere. Um, this is something that I had to work on the harsh startup. People like to have like a little light, nice conversation. Like, for example, talk to your daughter and say, Hi, honey, how was your day? Did everything you know, go away? It's so weird. So well at school today. Oh, sorry, you had a hard time with one of your tests. Yeah, we got a call from the school about that. But we can talk about that when you feel ready. But tell me what else happened during the day. It's a softer way to get at the issue versus your daughter walks in the door saying, We got a call from school today. We need to talk. Woo! Right away, right away, what's happening is you're setting it up where it's going to be a battle. The kitchen sinker. Well, I want to talk about a list of things. I want to talk about the person you're dating. I want to talk about some magazines we found in your room. I want to talk about your smelling of weird smells in your room. I don't know if you're smoking marijuana. I want to talk about the disrespect you show to your mother. I want to talk about the fact that we have a family part. Wow. Too much, too much, too much, too much, too much. It's going gonna, it's gonna to result in just the adolescent feel you're beating them up emotionally. Or you tell them, too many feelings. We're angry. We're embarrassed by you. We're worried about you. Tell us what what's, what you've been doing. Wow, that's a lot of emotions to throw at. Keep it simple. Simple, simple, simple. Not a lot of uh, strong, intense emotions. Just simple emotions can kind of help facilitate conversation. I know you're listening to all this and saying, not me, <laughs> but hopefully it will cause you to say, maybe you either grew up with that or maybe sometimes you fall into these things. I think we all do as parents. The monologue, uh, like a talk show host, where you find yourself talking, 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 talking. Mm. Not a good thing. Uh, I find that a real turnoff for me as an adult, but I'm sure you too. When somebody just keeps talking and talking and talking, 
and doesn't check on your interests, just wants to keep talking. A mental filter, your son says something to you that's important, but you don't like the way they said it. He says, I don't like your attitude. He said, I want to talk about car in the car. The way you ask, I don't like your attitude. You, you just lost the topic. It's a mental filter. It almost you have blinders on, and you only focus, focus on that specific detail and those two the bigger, bigger issue really added. Uh, the dart thrower, where you zap or got your comments to your son or daughter. Yeah, that's called a laziness. You know, <laughs> you throw a dart at them. They try to talk about why they didn't get something done. You keep saying lazy, lazy, lazy. Again, or lack of motivation, not motivated, lazy. All those terms never get you anywhere, really. Um, the fortress, where you resist influence and suggestions. I don't care what you say. I have my opinion. This is what I stand. If you do that, you're never going to have a conversation. All you're going to have is a, a monologue where basically it will just keep you know, being the same thing that is said again and again and again. The zombie. <laughs> uh, the zombie resurrects the past again and again and again and again and again. So the adolescent believes they never can get away from the mistake they made three months ago. Well, the last time you took the car, you didn't put gas in the car. Dad, that was six months ago. Ever since that six months I put gas in the car. I don't care. Again, it's related to the negative focuser. No, not, never. You know, just a negative person, the pessimist who doesn't believe the person will change. There's no future, no hope. Uh, the competitor, where you compete against your kids to be right. And it's not about being right or wrong. It's it's about helping your adolescents get through adolescence, grow and be a strong adult, incorporate the values and beliefs that you work so hard to teach them, but you don't want to throw them out because you're acting like a person who is a know-it-all, believes that you have to win them over in some way. That's just not how you work with teens. The interrupter, we've talked about the cross-examiner. The robot, where the adolescent talks, Dad, I had a fight with my, my girlfriend. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> you want to be emotional. You want to share that you can regulate your feelings. You can have your feelings and, and share your feelings. Oh, that's so sad. Tell me more about it. How you doing? You don't want to be, that is something that's part of growing up, son. You should just learn to deal with that. It's not the way you bond with an adolescent. The family feud, where you include other children, family, you bring everybody involved. So it's a personal talk where you and the teenager and everybody gets included. Um, or the other one is going fishing. You want the child to tell you what a great dad or mom or caretaker or you are. So didn't I show you that? Didn't I do that? Didn't I give you that money? Didn't I? It's not about you getting compliments. That's maybe you should focus on another way to get that. Your goal is to help the adolescent again develop their sense of competency by letting them, you know, try different things and learn from them. The dancer, where the adolescent asks you something, for example, you start talking about sexuality and right away you change the topic and you bring up another issue. The invalidator, again, you're watching television or texting when the teen talks. It's not working because you don't like it when the teen does it. The turtle who doesn't want to bring up topics, who avoids talking about things, doesn't bring up the fact that your son or daughter is showing warning signs of depression or substance use or inappropriate behavior. Or the volcano who always gets angry. Every time the adolescent brings up something you don't like, you're always getting angry, angry, angry all the time. The adolescent again knows not to bring up. The last word winner, you need to get the last comment in because you feel that somehow makes you win the contest with the adolescent. The de de demander who confuses wants and what would like versus what needs, what the adolescent really needs, because the adolescent will want a lot, but what do they really need is really important. And the fixer who wants to fix everything the adolescent brings rather than letting them have an opportunity to share their feelings and for them to try to work it through with you just being a good listener. Really, really important. So this is a three step communication guide when, when you want to share your feelings about what you don't like, but the adolescent does something. For example, if they come home and they leave their dishes in their room and you don't like that. Well, you say, when you leave the dishes in the room, I feel angry because I have to then go to your room and bring it all downstairs. It tends not, you're not yelling at them, you're not accusing them, you're letting them know your feelings. When you get home late, I feel scared because I worry a lot about what could happen to you out there because in the news there's always things happening. When you 
tell me you're smoking marijuana, I feel worried because I know that might affect your brain development and judgment. When you tell me to drop dead, I feel sad because I love you and I realize that I've not been communicating with you enough uh, or making you feel safe enough where you want to share with me. When you, I feel because rather than you're making me angry, they don't make you angry. Uh, it's their behavior that you react to that causes them to be angry. Because they're not making you angry. It's what their behavior is that causes the feeling, and you give them an explanation. I guarantee you, if you talk this way with your team, it results in a lot less defensiveness, and it helps the team begin to understand. And you can model this behavior so they can practice it too. So ultimately, it comes into reinforcing your bond with your team. Communication is a great currency to help reinforce your bond with your team, you know. And and sometimes, and I'm not saying you ask your, your team this, but they have to realize that you do have this strong bond with them. And if you didn't have the strong bond, well, it's going to be hard in adolescence when they're starting to become independent, you know, trying to get that bond suddenly back. Realize you put a lot of effort in building the infrastructure. You, you put a lot of effort in helping them grow as people. And sometimes it's important to let them know that you're with them and help them when they were sick. You help them when they were scared at night, when they were little. You help them with their homework. You'll really listen to them when they need someone to talk to. Who can you count on to help you in a crisis? They should know that whether it's two in the morning, three in the morning, whether they did something they're not proud of, whether they make a mistake, you're there. But they should also respect that part of the bond means that you can tell them when they were wrong and you can help them make things better. You're not going to put your head in the sand and let them hurt their lives. You're going to tell them the truth, even though it hurts both of you, and you'll do it in a kind and loving way to help them make things better. But that's really important. The bond is really important that you need to keep up with the team. And communication is a way to kind of keep that up. But also, I found that parents forget that um, bonding time when problems are not discussed are also important. That having those times together can be invaluable, just doing things, sporting events together, restaurants, concerts, movies, shopping, travel, hobbies, spiritual events, hiking, exercise, doing home repairs, doing bonding experiences with them where you don't bring up the problem, uh, problems that you do practice the bonding are essential because the communication is important. You don't want to get caught in those blind alleys, but you really want to be able to reinforce that bond because I think that makes a big difference. With them. So part of this whole process with them and to reinforce the bond is you need to be a positive role model. You need to be patient and accepting, even though they may get you and even though they may have you kind of biting your lip every so often, but model being calm and in control, but not non-emotion. You can say, honey, I'm a little sad that you say you hate me, uh, but obviously there might be, there must be something underneath that we need to talk about. Let's, let's talk about it. Practice self-care yourself. You can't say to the teenager, you got to watch what you eat. You shouldn't be, you know, staying up so late. You're staying up so late and you're drinking and, and you're acting out of control, but you got to be a positive role model. you got to regulate your own feelings and behaviors. Don't do as I say, not as I do. doesn't work because you'll lose all credibility with them. So be somebody who shows temperance in, in terms of what they do and their, their behavior and their actions, who uh, takes care of their body, who does some exercises, who with your their partner or people they with practice good communication with them too. They're always watching. I'm always amazed when I work with a teenager in a session. They know if I'm not feeling well. They know that something's worrying me just by looking at you. you, you it's, it's amazing how teens really start to become more and more socially adept at really understanding and, and figuring out everything in the social world. And we, we sometimes forget they're watching all the time. They're watching everything they do. Oftentimes they point at our, our foibles and things that we don't do well. Okay, that's fair. But I don't think modeling that you're perfect is a good role model. Life's hard. We all make mistakes. They make mistakes. And unfortunately, the world makes mistakes. Perfection is not something we want. We want to be able to learn and grow from our mistakes. And if you take that attitude with them and show that you can be calm and controlled, but yet have feelings, you can share if you're hurt or sad, that's okay. 
but be patient, practice self-care, and learn how to regulate. We've been watching this. Now, the big central message in communication is we all make mistakes and can be forgiven, and not setting up that there's nothing you can't walk back, no matter how horrible it is. It may be hard, it may be difficult, it may be sad, it may be embarrassing, but you're still there for them because you love them, and that's really the bond you have with them. Now, I think it's a good thing to share your beliefs and values, not lecture them, not monologue them, but you can be clear about what your beliefs on certain topics are. I think it's really important they know where you stand. They may not believe with you politically. They might not believe where you are in terms of certain moral issues or, or issues that are currently being debated in the media, but you can let them know where you stand. I don't think you have to hide your beliefs and values, and that includes um, your beliefs and why you have those beliefs. And they can be based on your faith, family, culture, your life experiences, and that's fair. And talk about specific examples of how your beliefs guide decisions, rather than talking about general abstract concepts like you need to show respect, obedience, motivation. That's, those are big words, and, I, and they mean something, I guess, but I don't know what exactly those words mean, and they're problematic, and they're provocative. I think it's fair that I believe this about this. And this is why I believe, based on my life experiences, based on my faith, based on my family culture. I think it's fair to do that. But again, make sure your values you propose are consistent with your actions. Don't say that I believe that everybody should treat it equally, but yet make comments that are disparaging about somebody um, uh, or a particular group of people. Your values are not you know, kind of matching what you're doing. So you've got to be consistent with what you believe and how you act. Uh, kind of finally, one of the more important things is, is this trust issue that uh, I think is a big issue. And um, problematic trust statements include, you will have to earn my trust. I do not trust you. How can I trust you now? I have lost trust in you. I do not trust your friends. Adolescents get enraged <laughs> by this, and they really don't like it. And I think it's this all or nothing trust concept that somehow we have in our mind. And Trust is not all or nothing. Trust is a little, a little bit more, a moderate amount, a little bit more, a little bit higher. But you never really get fully trusting your adolescent. But you also don't not trust your adolescent. Because if you didn't trust them and they were not safe, you would have to put them in a hospital because they were dangerous to self and others. And certainly when somebody is suicidal or very depressed, that may be necessary. Or violent where they need to be put in a hospital. Or you feel totally safe because adolescents do take risks and life sometimes can do things that you, you have, they have to be aware and they have to learn. Nobody comes out you know, in, into the world as an adolescent by knowing anything. And certainly we as adults are surprised all the time by what we learn and what we pick up. So trust is a matter of learning step by step in, in terms of learning and earning. Uh, that trust a little bit more. For example, if you let your son or daughter use the car and they were supposed to be home at 9 o'clock and they're home at 10 o'clock, you don't not trust them with the car, but you trust them less that they're, they're going to be able to manage their life. And you might say, listen, on the scale of 1 to 10, I gave you a 6 and I trusted you enough at a 6 to use the car, but since you brought home late, it's at a 5. And until I can get back to trusting you with a level 6, you can't have the car. That you don't say you don't trust them, you don't berate them, but you say you have to earn trust. Trust is not something you're just given. It's true of any relationship, it's in any partnership that you have, you give out trust in stages and it builds. It can go back down, it can be a 40%, it can be a 60%, it can be 70 and 80%, but it goes up and down. It's not an all or nothing concept. And the team has to earn more and more levels of the trust. For example, being able to use your car requires more trust than staying up late at night. Curfew all, is all about trust. You know, the later you spend at night for a team, the more danger can happen if that's a lot of things happen. So how do you how do you earn a less of a curfew? It's not a debate about whether they you love them or not that was curfew. It's really how do they earn a later curfew? How do they earn to be able to use the car more? How do they earn the ability to stay over friend's house overnight without you checking about where they are? How do you earn the ability to let them be in the house while you guys go away by themselves? That's what I would discourage you. 
uh, because it's not just the teen, but it's the pressure from their friends. Uh, I think it's a dangerous thing to let any teenager uh, have full control of the house because it's not just them, it's, it's everybody else. But that's a bit of an aside. Uh, but again, trust is not an all or nothing thing. Trust is something that you earn in degrees and trust, trust, uh, trust can go back, trust can go front, and that's okay, but they have to earn it and they have to uh, lose a bit of it, but not all the way. So the statements I said before, if you remember, earning my trust, no, you have to earn more of my trust in order for you to get this that you want. I do not trust you, that's not true. You do trust them, but maybe not enough to give them certain privileges. How can I trust you now? It's not accurate. I trust you a little bit less. You have to earn it back to get to a level where I give you that privilege. I have lost trust in you. Not true. I have lost as much trust in you. And I do not trust your friends. I do not trust your friends enough that I know that I can believe they're acting in your best interest. Maybe if I knew them better, maybe if I got to understand them better, I would have more trust in them. But the all or nothing trust thing never works with teenagers. So what I'd like you guys to do now, uh, I appreciate your time, and hopefully this will help you talk to your teens about this tough topic. If you can just get your phone and um, take a picture of this, it should take you to a website. And this is from our funder, uh, the Braveheart uh, Foundation. Um, and it will help us uh, basically be able to present more of these types of presentations to parents and schools. Um, and so if you can just do that for me, I'll leave this up for a minute. Just Take a picture of it, go to the website, fill it, I think it's four questions, and hopefully you enjoyed this presentation, you found it helpful. This will be able to help us do more. So thank you very much, and I appreciate this time, and hopefully all these tips will come in handy and help you have a rewarding and happy relationship with your children. I certainly enjoyed parenting my adolescent. I've had to apply all the things I've just shared with you now, but hopefully this will be helpful for you, and uh, you take care now. Thank you.